Uh, thanks for introducing me. Uh, this is a joint work with my co-authors, so I would like to thank them, all of them, for their hard work. This is also a collaboration between uh, Politecnico di Milano and Trend Micro. Let me first introduce what is an industrial robot. An industrial robot is nothing more than a mechanical arm. It can move in more than six axes, for example. Uh, it has an end effector. It can be like some pliers. Imagine it for pick and place applications. It, it has a controller, which is uh, basically a general purpose computer which implements the control system itself. And the human can interact with the robot in several ways. It can program the robot remotely, for example, or it can interact with the robot using an handle device called a teach pendant, and he uses to move the arm in position and let the robot register this position, and this is a technique called teaching by showing. Of course, the robot can be remotely accessible. For the industry 4.0 uh, vision, we notice that there are some trends that are starting to be used uh, when developing industrial systems and, of course, industrial robots. These robots are remotely exposed, often interconnected to the internet, for example, via some industrial routers. And this is due to the fact that they need to be really flexible just to make the production uh, be more, uh, more efficient. Another motivation is the lack of awareness. Uh, we ran a survey between uh, robot users and domain experts and found out that 28% of the users did not enforce access control policies. This means that no one can be blamed for any change to the program code that is running on the controller. 30% of the robots were directly accessible over the internet, just a direct connection, nothing in the middle, 76% did never perform a vulnerability assessment of the network on which the robot is attached, and more than half of the user did not think that a cyber attack was a realistic threat on industrial robots. So how can we define a robot-specific attack? We start by looking at the requirements that these robots should have. The first requirement is the one of accuracy, the robot should read precise values and issue correct and accurate comments. The second one is safety. Maybe someone of you is thinking of the first law of robotics of Asimov. It should never harm the human and correctly inform the operator about the status of the robot. The last one is the one of integrity. So no damage should be done to the robot. Even if a harmful command is issued, the controller should not execute it. A robot-specific attack is a digital bone violation of any of these requirements. Starting from these requirements, we developed five robot-specific attacks. The first one is the one of control loop alteration, in which the attacker will remotely or locally tamper the control loop parameters, so, for example, the PID parameters of the control loop, and this will allow him, for example, to introduce micro-defects in the production. The second attack, which is similar to the first one, the attacker can tamper with calibration parameters. The robot will use some calibration because the controller will need to know the exact position of the arm to compensate for the error in the position. These two attacks can be carried on because there's no check of any kind of integrity on the config files. There's some mild cryptography, but it's easy to break. The third attack is tampering with production logic. As for the configuration files, there's no integrity checks on the code that is running on the controller. So an attacker can easily modify the production logic, either introduce micro defects or change completely the production. The last attacks are the one about changing either the state of the robot, so change the state. Let's say the robot is off, the motors are off. The attacker can change the motors to on state or make it move faster than usual. Or, it's more scary, he can change the state that is perceived by the user. The user has this handle device, the teach pendant, that will report to him the status of the robot. If it is running in manual mode, in automatic mode, so the speed can change, the user will expect it to go slow in, a, in manual mode. 
it will report to the user that it is in manual mode, instead it's in automatic mode, and it can go to full speed. The standards regulation, the standard regulations warn the users that they must implement physical safeguard for industrial robots. Unfortunately, this is not always the case. As a follow-up to our work, there was an email sent to a, a public email list in which they described an incident. Their security team was doing an NMAP scan of the network. A Wacom LAN packet arrived on the, robot, on the controller and the robot started just swinging at full speed and the only physical safeguard was a red line painted on the floor. Fortunately, no one was armed, but there were witnesses. How can we go from these attacks to a realistic threat scenario? Well, the attacker can be willing to halt the production. This can cost up to $20,000 per minute. The source is Fanuc, a producer, uh, one of the biggest producers of robots. Or he could decide to alterate the outcome of the production, do physical damage to the robot. This is always very costly. Every minute will cost a lot to business or gain unauthorized access. I mean, on the controller, you, have, you can have some intellectual property because the processes for the production can be, can be proprietary. Or he could also ask for a ransom to disclose what micro defects he introduced. Imagine he introduced these micro defects only on five pieces out of a 2,000 pieces production stock batch. What you could do is say, yeah, I've introduced something. Either you recall the whole batch, or I will tell you what are these micro defects, but pay a ransom. To demonstrate that these attacks are feasible, we run a case study. The case study was run on an ABB ERC5 controller, which you see on the left, and the teach pendant on top, and an ERB140 six-axis uh, robot, which you can see on the right. Inside the cabinet, as we already said, there's just two general purpose computers which run Weeksworks, some FPGAs and discrete logic that are used for safety uh, measures, and the Teach Pendant is running Windows CE and uh, an outdated version of .NET framework. Inside this cabinet, we can find these general purpose computers, which are the main computer and the Axis computer. The main computer will interpret the code issue commands, the Axis computer is the one responsible of issuing the drive commands, and the drive unit and contactor unit are the ones that are responsible to just uh, run the, the, the robot and uh, get the voltage arrived to, to the robot, the high voltage arrived to the robot. The panel board is the one that, is, that comprises the discrete logic and FPGAs, and this is a good thing because it means that at least part of the safety measures are implemented in hardware and not in software. The robot is driven by the drive unit, and the end effector, the tool, can be driven by 24 volt digital signals as a standard. Regarding, instead, the connections to the robot, we can have a LAN port, a one port, which can be used also for servicing, for remote servicing, and attached to the service port or to the one port, there can be an industrial router that is connected, again, to a mobile network, operated by the vendor that the vendor can use to do remote maintenance. So as you can see, the remote attack surface is huge. Also, there is some physical uh, attack surface that was not part of our study. We found out that not only some robots were directly connected to the internet, but a lot of industrial routers are directly connected, and these routers usually conceal uh, some industrial control systems, and a lot of them had no authentication or known vulnerabilities or new vulnerabilities we discovered. In the, in the, in the controller, we discovered uh, several vulnerabilities uh, ranging from buffer overflows uh, leading to remote code execution to command execution and authentication bypass. Of course, these vulnerabilities are not interesting per se, but how we use them uh, to uh, gain full control of the controller was the point of this work to demonstrate the attacks. The full controller exploitation is composed of several of these vulnerabilities. We started using either static credentials to compromise the robot remotely or 
use the remote buffer overflow, disabled the user access control so that no checks are done on the permission that is connected to the robot, and then upload a malicious DLL that will get loaded on the teach pendant. And in the end, we trigger a reboot to make sure that uh, the controller is in a consistent state. And at this point, the malicious DLL will be loaded on the teach pendant, and the command and control functionality will be present on the teach pendant, and we will use the FTP web server that is present on the main controller to control remotely both the controller and the teach pendant. We developed three attack proof of concepts. The first one is the accuracy violation in which PID parameters are detuned, are modified, and a video will show you better than words. We couldn't bring the robot here because it's quite heavy. So we programmed the robot to just draw a straight line. It's the same thing that can happen uh, when a robot wields two car body parts together. As you can see, it's just a straight line. Nothing weird. The program code is easy. The program code, we don't change the program code. We run our attack, so we can see our attack is quite transparent to the user. And nothing changed again, but we sure? Let's look closely to the line that has been drawn. We introduced a few millimeters of difference. These few millimeters can, of course, cause a great damage. Image, like a point welding or any other machining process or welding process, I mean, you're running a car, you're on a car that can run 200 kilometers per hour, just a wrong welding can destroy your car and you. The second attack we implemented is the one on safety violation. It's a safety violation. Uh, in this, we implemented the user perceived robot state alteration. We uploaded this malicious DLL, which would show to the user the status of the robot as manual mode, so it should go slow and be controlled directly by the user, not by code and the motor's off. But what is happening instead inside is that the robot is in automatic mode and the motors are on. The last attack we implemented is the one of integrity violation in which we modified the control loop parameters to make the robot arm collapse on, it, on itself and damage the motors substantially. Of course, it's a quite risky proof of concept. We weren't allowed to test it on the robot, not only because it costs $20,000 used and $80,000 and more if it's new, but also because of safety regulations. We were not allowed to do this. But we verified with a robotics expert that the outcome should be the one that we theorized. As a conclusion and for future challenges, uh, the new standards, the standards and the regulations uh, should not only define uh, uh, the problems that are related to safety issues, but should also consider an active attacker, thing that is not present in nowadays standards. Moreover, more work should be done on attack detection and hardening uh, in this kind of real-time operating systems. And the future, of course, is the one of secure collaborative robots. Collaborative robots are like industrial robots. They can be as huge and as harmful as in normal industrial robots. But the thing that changes is that collaborative robots are not caged. There's no physical safeguards. So it is developed for a close collaboration, a close interaction with the human operator. And also, safety measures are more complex and so they are implemented in software, not in hardware. Of course, there will be more work will be needed to secure these kind of robots. Detailed countermeasures are uh, described in the paper. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's thank the speaker. I'm waiting for a question, but I actually uh, have a couple. Uh, the first one is. It seems that you were able to inject code on the controller, but you were not able to affect the code base of the actual robotic arm or its firmware. Can you say something about it? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, basically, no uh, trust is that no code integrity 
no checks are done not only on the integrity of the code that is uploaded, so the logic of the production, but we found out that also the firmwares are absolutely vulnerable to this kind of attacks. Uh, both the uh, firmware running on the main controller, the one running on the Axis computer, and the one running on the Teach Pendant uh, have basically no checks at all or just some mild cryptography that we can easily overcome. So it's, I think it's easy to just um, modify the firmware. If but you guys haven't to. explored that yet? E yeah. Okay. So well, then I get to ask my second question, which is um, what I almost always ask when there are papers like this. So what is specific to you know, the pen testing of a robot that you find is most, most characterizing and novel in this work? Uh, um, okay, first of all, uh, let's say there's, there's all uh, uh, the, most of the vulnerabilities we found, we can apply them uh, also to other industrial control systems. The problem with the industrial control system is that they are heterogeneous. So you cannot, let's say, easily apply the attack from on a chemical plant and a different one on a robot and so on. So you have to develop some specific techniques for each kind of industrial control system. And moreover, the issue that we found uh, characterizes the most the problems, the security problems on, on industrial robots are the ones that involve uh, human robot interaction. I think is one of the few industrial control system that requires uh, this much and this close interaction with the human. So where the human is in the loop, we all know that way to fails are so many. All right, let's thank the speaker again.